All right, 2022 season is upon us. Welcome back to the Tour Breakaway. Uh, special guest today, uh, you probably know him from being all over the world tour for a number of years now, former U.S. champion, winner of stage in uh, the Tour de Suisse, and rider for AG2R, Larry Warbess. Welcome. Thanks. How's it going? Yeah, fantastic. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, stoked to talk, see what's going on. Life in Nice, life in the pro peloton, and everything you've got planned for um, for the year ahead. So we were just chatting. I know you live in Nice. How like how long have you been there in in total? <clears throat> so this will be my ninth year living in Nice, and then my tenth year living in Europe. Um, so my first year, I lived in in Italy in Tuscany, uh, just outside of Florence. And then, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my second year, I moved moved to Nice, and I've lived here ever since. So yeah, quite a long time now, which is pretty crazy. That. I mean, that's borderline. Is is Nice home? Like, do you consider that home now? Or, or will yeah, it always I be mean, Michigan? Yeah, I mean, I still, like, call... I mean, I call it home, but then, I, I mean, I also call Michigan home at the same time, even though I don't go there very much at all. So, no. yeah, definitely, uh, I definitely call it home. But uh, <clears throat> I say two homes, I guess. It's fair. Yeah. So, there, there's that's, like, probably one of the top uh, three or four like meccas for for pro cycling where you've got a huge concentration of riders when you're out for your rides who are you riding with most frequently um i train with richie port a lot i train with michael valgren a lot um and then i train with like the american guys who are here like uh joe dombrowski mateo jorgensen um will barda sometimes and then um i also have uh like a teammate who lives in nice his name's yako hanninen Mm -hmm. um so yeah i kind of and then there's like <clears throat> other guys who like you ride with a bit but those are probably the guys i train with the most i would say yeah sweet i know some of those i think have been teammates over the past but i, I don't think you've ever been teammates with richie port before have you no no just like uh <clears throat> friends and like um i got to know him well through ian boswell who uh -huh. was teammates with him uh on sky for a long time and then uh yeah so we just kept training together once Ian uh, went back to the U S but yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, so when you're over there and whether you're training with these guys or not, you're presumably seeing a bunch of guys out on the roads. Yeah. Is there, do you have like a go-to like flick handshake nod for when you pass another guy out on the roads? I mean, I think you just wave, you know, and like say, Hey, but that, that's pretty much it. Like a full, so. like hand off the handlebar wave, full hand yeah, wave, yeah, yeah, nod. Yeah, 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 for All sure. Right. Right. Yeah. Is there anybody who has like a really gratuitous, like, like you, every time you see them, you're like, Oh, I'm going to get a really friendly wave. Any like differentiated uh, waves out there? No, I don't think so. But it is kind of funny because I would say like pros wave a lot more than like, uh, amateurs and stuff. Like, like, I don't know. I'm just used to like in the U S a lot of people are pretty friendly. Like if you're riding around, like a lot of people wave and stuff. It's uh -huh. like, so I just am in the habit of waving to everyone. And it's like a lot of like, normal people don't wave but all the pros definitely wave so <laughs> is that is that like being in like you've got like the the dudes with beards club it's like okay we're both we're both in the same shtick we're both riders so we're gonna wave is, is exactly, is it like exactly kind of the camaraderie? Yeah. yeah yeah that checks out that's that's kind of funny i mean for for the non for the amateur riders presumably if they're like out there in the hills they, they at least recognize the bibs on are they like intimidated to wave or they're just on uh, their own no their i don't think thing? so i think they're just kind of like not used to people waving, you know? So I think they just like, Oh, <laughs> but. Uh, that's good. What? Um, and so if you're, if you're out alone, what do you, what are you listening to? If anything? Um, yeah, I have like, uh, those headphones I think they're called jawbreakers or whatever the ones that like, they're like bone conducting. So they don't actually go in the ear. They go like over. Um, uh -huh. so I like to listen to that just cause like there is a decent amount of traffic and like, uh, oh. I think it's probably good to be able to hear some of like the road noise. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of depends like, but I actually like listening to like Spotify's sort of like workout playlists and like uh, the power workout one has like mm -hmm. a bit of rap and stuff. So I kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I would, I like those. Uh, that's pretty much my go-to when I'm riding, I would say. Sure. And then uh, off the bike in Nice, do you, do you ever bump into the guys uh, just like any pro riders randomly at like restaurants, bars that you weren't planning to? 
really rarely actually because it's like a pretty big city um and so i mean like obviously like we hang out off the bike as well so like Mm -hmm. you know yeah you plan to like hang out with guys but like actually like randomly running into people is a lot less frequent than you would think for how many people are based here Mm -hmm. um which is kind of nice though too because like you know i hear stories of like jerome and it's like you can't leave the house without like running into a bunch of guys so <clears throat> here it's kind of nice when you're in like on the bike you see everyone but like uh or you know like okay if we like are riding there's like certain bakeries that we like like to stop at like mm. to grab a coffee and like a pastry and then if you're there you always run into a bunch of guys sure but like uh if you're like in town just like normally out or whatever you hardly ever see anyone uh which yeah. is, it's kind of a nice balance so then once you're like when you're off like you're off so that's nice when when you do do a coffee ride what's your what's your go-to pastry at the coffee shop um so the thing is well no so that depends if i'm doing like a big ride and we stop at the bakery then i get something different than on an easy day so like on my easy days i like to ride to like the starbucks in monaco and get yeah. like a, a latte because it just makes me feel like i'm like in the u.s you know mm-hmm. and then um when we do like big rides and we go to like a bakery or something i really like to get the like uh chocolate it's like a almond chocolate croissant and that's really good so yeah. that's definitely my uh go-to <laughs> yeah. yeah that sounds those are delightful that's awesome yeah uh, so last year so i know 2020 you rode the giro uh but yeah. the, the tour de france did start down in nice and it was like super famous for like you know you just had that slashing of rain and everyone was slipping yeah. all over the place. you know these roads super well were, were you there to watch the tour when it came through? Um, I was here, but I didn't, I didn't like go watch it in person. Like I just watched it on TV. <laughs> it's Knowing, like, uh, yeah. easier to watch on TV, I would say. Yeah, totally. I've always wondered about that because I've always wanted to go watch a grand tour. And I actually, I did see the tour de France like once and it, it was like, you know, and then that's exactly. Kind of it. Yeah. <laughs> you get a lot more on TV. Um, but you know, those roads, like how bad was it out there that day? Just based on your experience of like no rain and then rain. Yeah, that's the problem here. It's like, it really doesn't rain that much, but it's kind of funny because it seems that every time like a bike race passes through, it like pours. So like, no one believes this when we say it never rains here, but like, uh, yeah, when it rains, it's so slippery because like, yeah, it doesn't rain very much. And like the roads they went on like that first day where there was like all those crashes, like when it doesn't rain for a long time and then it rains, they're just like really treacherous. So, so yeah, it's, uh, that's that's actually pretty standard uh so it's like when it hasn't rained for a really long time and then it does rain it's actually really dangerous uh to ride here so. yeah it, lo- it looked it it looked horrible um it looked yeah. absolutely horrible um cool all right so uh so last night i watched the the um the documentary that you did with connor dune a couple of years ago uh oh, sick. The, the and so we rode uh just as yeah. like a little bit more a little more background uh, on your no-go tour uh, with that, you know, pretty, had to be pretty jarring that situation with Aqua Blue Sport when that whole thing fell through. Um, but I got a couple questions because yeah. um, I want to know if Lachlan Morton has publicly stated that that was the inspiration for his alt tour that he did last year. Oh, I don't know about that. I think the thing is, is like, uh, you know, we also were conscious of like when we were doing what we were doing that like you know <clears throat> lachlan had done like the thereabouts thing with his brother and we we're like mm-hmm. we really don't want to do the same thing as he did you know like we don't want to like be like copycats kind of you know yeah. um so so yeah i don't think uh lachlan definitely uh took anything from us i don't know i didn't watch anything that he did like I, obviously i know that what he was doing but i didn't see any of the videos so yeah but yeah no i um, think uh we're probably at higher risk for uh copyright infringement than uh he is <laughs> i was uh, i had a laugh when i was watching about halfway through you you had pointed out to connor that his saddlebag was loose his flip-flops were sticking out of him and he ended up losing his flip-flops i was thinking back to lachlan's alt tour last year where he kind of famously rode most of it wearing sandals oh, yeah. yeah and yeah, i was yeah. like is that a flex on these guys for having Maybe. a loose saddlebag i didn't even think about that yeah <laughs> I think um, I would have abandoned at that point if I had to wear Birkenstocks for the uh, 
entire Tour de France, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely blister heavy uh, with yeah. with those ones. Uh, favorite Haribo product? I really like the sour ones. So here they're called like Peak, and so it's like uh, there's like a few different like Peak ones. There's one called like Miami Peak, which is like this rainbow sour uh strip kind of thing those oh, are yeah, really good i would say those are probably my favorite and uh do you find that harry bows taste different in different countries uh maybe slightly but i haven't tasted them too much outside of europe so it's uh it's hard to say uh-huh would you say that they are the best gummy brand on the planet i would say probably yeah I mean, maybe there's some really bougie one out there that I haven't tasted yet that could one up it, but uh, but it's pretty good. Yeah, and no, it's I good think, ride food. I think you'd know by now if there was a better one. Yeah, maybe. Or safe to say. Um, I did see at the end of the when the credits came on in the um, in the documentary that it was a big collaboration with the cycling podcast, and that Orlo was the executive producer. It had all the guys on it uh, in the credits: Lionel Richie, Richard Moore, all those folks. How did you get linked up with that crew? Um, so we've been like friends with the cycling podcast for quite a long time, actually. Um, so we, I don't know, like we'd been on the podcast a few times and they'd come to Nice to do like, um, an episode before. And so like, yeah, I've probably known them for now, you know, I don't know how many years, but probably like seven years or something. So it's been quite a long time. Um, like Ian Boswell got to know them like first and then kind of introduced us. Um, and so, yeah. And then, you know, I just sort of always stayed in contact with them. If I see them at races, like I always, uh, chat with them. Um, and then, so sometimes we go on and then we've done like audio diaries for them before. Mm -hmm. And then when we did this tour, actually, so the whole story, we were supposed to do tour of Britain, et cetera. And like Connor was supposed to do an audio diary during the tour of Britain for the cycling podcast. And then like, you know, whatever, a few days before Tour of Britain, we find out we're not doing it. And then we decided to do this tour and they're like, oh, do you want to still do your auto audio diary? Uh, and like, you know, we'll make like an episode. And, and he was like, yeah, sure. So we ended up doing this audio diary for them during that. And then they knew that we had like filmed a bunch of stuff during it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we had thought about like putting together our own video and putting it out there. And then they like proposed to us to like make a documentary because like they kind of wanted to go into like uh, um, like video in addition to just audio. And so they're like, oh, it would maybe be a good first project. Um, so they asked us if we would want to do that. And we said, yeah, definitely. So, so that was kind of how it happened. And I know that Connor is now with GCN. Yeah. Um, Full time, but he's he's all over their um, their stuff full time. Um, is that something that interests you, or do you plan to do more of that stuff in the future? Is that a, a niche? Um, for I you? think we'd like to like do these trips regularly. Um, you know, whether I mean, I wouldn't mind like doing something like commentating one day. Um, I think like it takes a pretty special character to be able to do what Connor does. You know, as like the presenter making like um, all the videos for GCN like on a daily basis. Like, that's, like, really hard. And and I don't know, like, I think that would be pretty challenging for me. Um, but, like, you know, I think he has, like, really the perfect personality for that. And uh, so he really enjoys it. Um, but I don't know if I'd want to do, like, that. But maybe potentially, like, race commentating I'd really like doing. Mm -hmm. Have you dabbled? Have you covered any, any smaller races? No, no. I've been asked a couple times. But um, I've never really had the time because it's obviously always during the season. Sure. And uh, it's kind of required me to like go and then like, you know, I have to train. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, makes total sense. Um, it, it was, you know, watching that and it's super enjoyable to see that, you know, that little journey. But it was kind of on the heels of what had to be and what you stated is like pretty jarring. Like you're coming off being in super good form, like everything was kind of going in the right direction. And then that, you know, the, the team just kind of folds. What did that like? do what was your like takeaway from that and thinking like holistically about just the sport your interests and all like all the different things you want to do in your life on and off the bike um 
I mean, to be honest, it was kind of like par for the course for me because like uh, I had struggled with like contract stuff before and, you know, it was like I am folded um, in 2016 and I, I really like, you know, I really only found Akabu at the last minute. So it was just kind of like nothing really new for me. And luckily I'd had such a good year the year before um, that it was like it was pretty easy for me um, to find a team after. Yeah. Um but yeah, I mean, obviously it's like hard, but yeah, I guess the thing is, is like, that was kind of already my experience in cycling, like leading up to this point. So I wasn't really that shocked. Uh, so yeah, it's not, it's pretty volatile uh, uh, environment. Um, yeah. So yeah. Totally. Um, so then, I mean, now with AG2R, been with a couple of teams throughout your your career as a pro and even more um when you're coming up the ranks i mean just thinking about like my work like we're always talking about like high performing teams and teams that are like overperforming for whatever reason that are like aligned around common goals with are you know trusting each other like when you look at the teams you've been on does one team stick out as just like that was the best like most high performing team that that you've been on not exactly. I mean, the thing is, is like all of them had their like strengths and all of them had their weaknesses. And so I wouldn't say there was one that I was just like, oh, my God, you know, like so far and above uh, the rest. One thing that I thought was interesting, I would say for the budget, Aqua Blue probably had like the best quality of riders for like uh, the budget they had. Um, so like we had actually a really strong team. Um, even though we had like a small budget and like, you know, they didn't have a lot of money to pay like any big riders or anything. So, um, that actually impressed me is like, they really did their like research and homework in selecting guys. And so, mm -hmm. um, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, because, you know, it shows you don't necessarily need to sign like the biggest names to have like a really strong team. So. Totally. Yeah. Um, you've also, I mean, you've kind of been across, like when you came into the sport, I know you were with like the Hincapie team, you rode with Cadell Evans and then you r rode right through like Contador and then through the like kind of current uh, folks of the generation that are on their way out. And then the newcomers, the Frooms, the Quintanas, the Valverdes, the you name it. Um, and then now you're seeing all the the younger guys come up, the Bernals, the, the Pogs, et cetera. Um, have you ever felt like or, or at any point in time, has there ever been guys in the Peloton that actually like feel larger than life? Or are they all just like, yep, that's just a guy and a rider? And what's it, what's that been like? Um, I think that was more like, and maybe it was like, um, you know, the previous generation, maybe like, yeah, I guess like Contador maybe seemed a bit like, yeah, larger than life or something. Maybe it's because like, you know, when I was younger, I grew up watching him and stuff. And then like all of a sudden you're in like the Peloton next to him. So you have this kind of like respect, whereas like I was kind of in the Peloton with all the other guys as they like got good. And so like, you know, when you're in the Peloton for a while, you pretty much know everyone. So it's kind of like, you know, you're sort of like you're friends with all the guys. So it's they they don't seem like, oh, my God, that's whoever, whoever, you know, because you're like, oh, yeah, like, you know, I just saw him out training today. Like we ended up chatting for like 20 minutes and then, you know, it's like so in the end like when you know the guys they they seem like a lot less like holy shit you know um whereas like yeah i guess like contador for example was always kind of like the myth in the peloton you know mm -hmm. and okay he also didn't really speak english very well so i don't think he was really talking to that many people uh so fair um and then uh, what about teammates have is there anybody that stands out from the teams you've been on as like the like a standout teammate, whether they were just like a great elite, great leader, great teammate, um, et cetera. Does anybody stand out? Um, I would say like as a teammate, a guy like Mickey Cher, um, who's on my team again, um, he really like stands out for me as like, he's like probably one of the best helpers out there. And so he was on BMC with me and like, he really sort of took me under his wing and like really taught me a lot about like being professional and, you know, like how to work in the team and stuff. So it was kind of cool because, like, you know, my time at BMC, I spent a lot of time with him. And then mm -hmm. last year he came to Asia 2R. So it's kind of nice to have him uh, back. Um, that's really nice. And then, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, so I ended up riding with some big guys like Cadell and stuff like that. 
I mean, I definitely, when I raced with Cadell, I did realize like he, his knowledge was actually pretty incredible. Like I remember once, I mean, it was like, we did like Tour of Alberta, which is like a small race, but like, I remember the way he was talking about how he was like what he saw at the start of the race. And like, you know, he was talking about these things that I was like, holy shit, like, how did you know that? Or how did you see that? And he was just really good at reading a race. Mm. Um, and I just thought that was really cool because like before that, I kind of just thought it was like a crapshoot. You know, he was talking about like he went in the breakaway one day and um, I think he even won the stage. But like he was talking about how when he was like about to go in the breakaway, the things he was seeing. And and I was like, wow, that's actually really impressive because like, um, you know, you realize like it is really calculating and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And in, in that, was that all just race dynamics? Like you saw the, the reactions or lack of reactions and kind of the overall situation in the race? And Exactly. Yeah. From like certain teams and this and that. And so it was pretty interesting. And like since then, I've gotten a lot better at that myself. Um, but yeah, it's like uh, it's kind of interesting to see that kind of stuff. Um, and then so you've you've done the Giro four times, the Vuelta four times which of those is do you prefer um okay i really like racing in italy it's like i love italy as a country and stuff amazing food really cool places beautiful landscape but i I think i actually like preferred racing the vuelta because it's just a bit more chill um and the giro is just like it's so hard um the vuelta has like some shorter stages and a lot of climbs are like shorter and punchier Mm-hmm. And then the weather's always good. Um, whereas like the Giro, you can have just like the worst weather ever. And you do these stages that are the most like messed up, like crazy. Like in 2020, it was like, oh my God, I've never been more exhausted in my life than I was. We had like some like four days like back to back that were like so messed up. You know, like four days back to back that were like all more than six and a half hours or something. And like, just the biggest days of your life, four of them back to back. It was like the equivalent of like doing like Liège best on Liège, Amstel gold race, like two times in a row back to back. And it was like uh, ridiculous. So well, there, and, and there was a point where the riders uh, protested for a shortened stay. Yeah, so that, that was last year? the day after those four days. So like the fifth day, which like was supposed to be 250K. Then we get a message in the morning a bridge fell out and then was going to be 260 K because we had to take a detour around this bridge and it was pouring rain. And we had finished the day before was like the Stelvio stage. So it was almost like seven hours. I think the Gruppetto probably finished almost in the dark. So we got to the hotel super late. We probably ate at like 11 PM and then we had to leave at like five in the morning to go to this next stage. So, um, I think everyone was just literally on their wits end. And actually, I think what actually like really triggered it was like everyone got there. Everyone was in this super big rush to get ready. It was pouring rain. It was going to be 260 K. And then we were leaving the buses to go to the start and it ended up being like three or four K to the sign in. So everyone just assumed it was going to be a few hundred meters. So no one took any of their stuff everyone gets to the sign in and we ended up we were supposed to be somewhere middle of the pack for like signing in and like we ended up being the first people there because everyone was so late and like uh then we were like yelling in our radios like bring bring this bring this bring this rain jacket bring this gaba bring whatever and um so then we got there and then like no one was able to go back to their team buses because it was so far so everyone ended up like huddling under this tent and it was pouring rain and everyone was dead. And everyone's like, this is going to be the worst day on earth. And then it was just kind of like all of a sudden everyone just started being like, fuck this, like we shouldn't do this, you know? And then like, it just kind of, kind of like built and built and built. And all of a sudden everyone's like, yeah, like who's going to make us ride today? <laughs> and then like, everyone just said, yeah, let's just, okay. Either they shorten the stage or we just don't leave, you know? And then everyone's like, yeah okay because like all of the teams ended up under these two tents like literally like you know those tiny pop-up tents that you'd see at like a local race just like two of those so it was the entire peloton like you know whatever almost 200 guys under these tents and everyone's like yeah we're not doing this today and uh and then like finally like they brought over the organizer and we like gave him the choice like you know either 
either we do like half the stage or we don't ride. And then he was like, okay, I guess we do half the stage. And then everyone's like, Woo! And it was like, it was like this eruption of joy. It was like everyone had just won a stage, you know? Yeah. So it was pretty funny. And so who was like the front man? Was that all rider driven? Was that all It was you all got? rider driven. Yeah, yeah. Like the CPA, like that are supposed to be the, uh, the union or whatever, like, they weren't like, you know, they were like, oh, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. And then everyone's like, well, why not? You know, like no one here wants to go do this. So, um, so yeah, it was just kind of like a few riders started talking and then started asking every single team. And then um, it was like, really, everyone came to the decision together. And then like uh, Adam Hansen like volunteered to like speak to the guy, you know, but it was really like everyone together decided this. Yeah. And, you know, it was like maybe like one or two teams were like, oh, we should do the full stage. But like no one was against not doing it, you know. So it was, uh, yeah, it was actually kind of cool to see like uh, the solidarity between the guys. Yeah, for sure. I, and to be fair, like I believe it was a relatively flat stage. So basically it, was it wasn't consequential to the stage. Yeah. It, well, like, it wasn't consequential to the stage. Like, it was just oh, like no. you cut off 100K of flat, right? It would have been right? the most boring stage ever, but it ended up being exciting because it ended up being like 130K or 100K, or, I don't know. And then, like, everyone was still kind of sleeping when they got off the bus because, like, you know, it ended up, like, doing this long transfer again, whatever. And so then this breakaway, like, 13 guys went, and then, like, behind Bora was chasing, like, as hard as they could, and, like... And then they all exploded and then it was like 13 guys fought out for the win. So like it ended up being a way cooler stage than it would have otherwise been. So, uh, cause 260 K people would have been fighting to not go in the breakaway. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. That's great. Um, so I guess on that thread, like of all the things you've seen in races and this is probably like organization aside, like what's the, what's the craziest thing you recall seeing in a race, whether it was like rider related or like off to the side or anything like that. I mean, that was pretty crazy. I'm trying to think. Hmm. Cattle crossing the road or uh, yeah, I've never really parachuters into, into the streets. <laughs> Sorry? Or like people parachuting into the streets, anything just like outlandish. I'm really trying to think. Surely I've seen a couple things. It was like, that's crazy, but I kind of forgot about them. Um, one thing I remember that was pretty cool was like, oops, once in like the Vuelta, I think we were riding through like San Sebastian and, um, and like just off to the left of us, they were like surfing. And then like this girl caught this like massive wave and then like the whole Peloton is like cheering for her and stuff. And, like, I was like, oh, that was pretty cool. Um, but in terms of like things that are like <clears throat> really crazy, I mean, beyond just like crazy weather stuff and things like that, I don't. You know, just guys like absolutely frozen and shaking and shivering and like, you know, wondering how we can even like do the things that we're doing. Uh, I don't really, I don't really recall too many super crazy things. It's I'll have to like remember some, but. <laughs> For next time. Yeah. Um, so when you're out in a grand tour, I mean, while we're on that thread, <clears throat> like when you finish, like you've just done three weeks of just hell. Uh, what's the like one food that you can't wait to have that you just haven't had a chance to go for? I mean, I definitely like my ice cream. Like I crush ice cream normally. Um, and then when you're at races, you don't really eat ice cream. So I really like like good gelato. Uh, mm. That's definitely like my go-to. Um, so yeah, good gelato. I also really like cookies, but in Europe, it's really hard to get good cookies, like chocolate chip. Um, so so yeah, um, I'd have to say probably gelato is my really like go-to go-to. I Solid. also like a good pizza. Oh yeah. Uh, what about um, what about like are there any guilty pleasures during a race? Like maybe like it's like week three of a grand tour. Um, maybe it's like a mountain stage, but you've like done your job. You maybe you're out the back, and uh, somebody just dropped back to the team car to grab some stuff. Like, what are you hoping they come back with? I mean, the dream, the problem is our team never has this, but other teams do sometimes is like, you know, like a Snickers or a Mars bar or something like that's just the best when someone has like a real like old school candy bar and like our team never has it. But a lot of other teams, like in the third week of like a grand tour, they just like start popping like Snickers and Mars in the like feedbacks. 
And so then sometimes like your friends in the Peloton be like, Hey, you want one? And I'm like, Oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's pretty good. And I mean, you know, Coke's always good too. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a little horse trading for snacks out there. Amongst oh yeah, around. sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um, so back here at home, I mean, just kind of switching gears a little bit, we haven't really had much world tour or even pro level road racing going on. I mean, with the tour of uh, tour of California going out a couple of years ago, tour of Utah um, have, hasn't been back. Do you miss those? Do you miss those races? Like, did you enjoy racing on U.S. soil, uh, like nationals aside? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, I really miss those races. You know, it's like, you know everyone in the Peloton just thought like uh true California was like the greatest race on earth. So, um, you know, especially for us, like Americans, it's really sad to like have those races gone. And then tour Utah was such a nice race and it was so well organized. And yeah, I really enjoyed going there too and spending time in park city and stuff. Um, so, so yeah, that, uh, that really, it's really sad to miss out on those races now. And yeah, I mean, I really thought like Tour Utah would definitely keep going. So to see that they also stopped was pretty, pretty devastating. And then, yeah, even like I remember in 2013, we did Tour Colorado and that was probably one of my, the most fun races I've ever done. You know, I just really enjoyed that. And it's like the crowds are so awesome. And so, yeah, it's kind of sad to have all those uh, races gone. So uh, I don't know. It'd be nice if one day they could come back, but I, I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> Hopefully. I mean, definitely yeah. fingers crossed. I mean, and on the tour of California side, the talent that came through was incredible. Like it really was oh, yeah. a proper, proper world tour event. Yeah, for sure. It's also like, I mean, for all the like bike companies and sponsors, like, you know, to get exposure in the US, it was like huge. Um, so it was really, really important for almost every team. Yeah. Do you think that that has had any type of impact on on us cycling over the last couple of years the fact that those tours have been absent. i mean the one thing i think it's definitely had a big impact on is like the on the continental circuit in the u.s like uh you know we see that like there pretty much is no continental circuit anymore so you know like there's criteriums and stuff and it seems like the criteriums and with like legion and stuff like <clears throat> that's getting really big and you know that's maybe one of the strongest it's been but like in terms of the road racing side and like, you know, having like good, like UCI level races and stuff. Yeah. I mean, they've almost all disappeared, which is really sad because like when I was young um, and starting to turn pro, there was like always still a really good, like, uh, you know, <clears throat> US circuit for like, you know, continental level teams. And there was like a bunch of continental level teams and, you know, uh, it was like pretty high level and really well organized and run and like, now there's like i don't know two continental teams in the us or you know there's really hardly any maybe three it's like it's pretty sad yeah it's super thin the i mean to your point the crit scene and also the gravel scene i mean you're you're um, definitely a gravel scene in and now, like they they both seem like really healthy scenes do you think that's a an effect of that or do you think that's just kind of like preferences of riders i think it's probably because like well, one, both of those are way easier to organize than to get like road closures. You know, I think it's probably things with like insurance and road closures and everything. It's just so expensive for like a general race. You know, I know the Tour of California, they lost like a significant amount of money every single year. Um, and I think it's probably the biggest expense is like closing off all those big roads for such long periods of time. So it's like gravel, like no one's on these back gravel roads, you know, it's like, so it's way easier to like get permission to like close those off than it is, you know, some main street in like downtown LA or something. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's probably like why a lot of races have gone that way. And then there's just been, yeah, such like um, a passionate following of like those things. And it's like criteriums. Yeah. It's way easier to shut down like, you know, city block than it is like a bunch of, you know, roads for hours. And then, and they're also way better to watch, you know, like crits than like a normal road race. So, yeah, um, I think that's probably, you know, that too. So that's a great point. I didn't, I didn't even think of those. And in some cases, crits, it's like in a parking lot. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we prefer so, yeah. ones on real roads, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet. Um, awesome. All right. Um, zooming out a little bit again. Um, I, I was reading the interview you did recently with Cycling News and you, you talked a little bit about just changes in the sport and, 
it kind of set off some light bulbs for me as a fan of the sport where it seemed like as like a lay fan that even just like five years ago, when you think about the general classification and grand tours and such, it was very much a culture of like, you know, guys under 25, you're, you're really focused on coming up through, through like the, um, you know, young rider classification, you're going to have a more senior GC guy in the team, you build into this and then you eventually get your, your opportunity. And like, you know, 27, 28, 29 was like kind of like the peak of those, you know, when those guys started moving into their peak. And then all of a sudden over the last couple of years, you see like records being set with like Bernal and Pogacar being like the youngest guys ever to win uh, Tour de France. And, and you kind of see it across all different types of races where really young guys, you know, 20, 21 are, are having a big impact. Has that like being on the ground and being in the pro Peloton, like, is that change real? Like has the mentality and the way that teams are organizing and looking at their talent and planning for talent, has it changed or is it just like, it just happens to be that we've seen some really young talent be um, really strong the last few years. Yeah, no, no, it's definitely changed. I mean, you know, in the past it was like, I remember like, I remember maybe I was reading Lance's book when I was younger and stuff. And like in those days, it was like, they always thought like, 29 to 32 was like your peak, you know, because like, oh, you had to build up all the miles in your legs and whatever. And now people are seeing these young guys just crushing it. And so then all the teams are like, wait, why are we signing guys who are like, you know, starting to go down when we can like sign guys who are only going to get better um, if they can already start winning these races. And so, um, I mean, every team just wants to sign kids. Um, So, you know, I think our team probably didn't, they signed five guys this year. There's probably not one who's over 24. Um, and that's just how it's been on uh, every single team. Um, so, you know, it's like I have friends. Well, I have a lot of friends who, you know, maybe some that wanted to continue. But, you know, if they were like 34 or 35, they didn't really have a choice uh, to, to continue. And then even guys who were like around my age, like 30, 31, it was like the hardest uh, year for them to find contracts where otherwise they would have like never had a problem before. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely like this huge shift in the Peloton where like all the teams think they need to sign like, uh, kids and, and, you know, I think it's partially because like so many of the juniors and stuff like that, they're just so serious and focused right from like the start. Um, and so they do have like that level, um, you know, it's like, they're living like pros already. They're doing 30 hour weeks and stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like when, most of the guys around my age when we were juniors it was like i mean we were just kind of like doing whatever and riding with our friends and you know like i just ski the whole winter and you know wouldn't touch my bike for like four months and then come back and start riding again you know and it's like uh now it's like they're really living like pros before uh before they even are under 23 so yeah wow um and like even your team specifically AG2R, like they seemed to have always been like that very traditional mindset yeah. and strategy. And then went through a very big shift just after you joined, like it was the Roman Bardet show, like yeah. traditional GC for a long time. And then all of a sudden he's out, Greg Van Avermaet comes in, uh, Bob Youngles, like very much different strategy. I mean, both in terms of overall racing, um, kind of moving away from the GC, um, what's it like what's been the feeling on the team culture wise just within ag2r over the last couple of years i mean the cool thing like what i've seen on ag2r is like they're actually like you know supporting a lot they're like young sort of like homegrown guys and that's pretty sweet um so like you saw like benoit cosnefral this year he's been like crushing it and, and that was awesome because like uh you know he he like went up through their under 23 team signed with the team and like you know, he's had this really steady progression. Like, you know, he started off with like a little bit slow and now he's really killing it. And so that's pretty cool. And then we have another guy named like Aurelion Perry Ponch. And mm-hmm. he was like, I don't know, maybe 14th in the tour this year. And he's like still really young. So, uh, um, so it's cool to see, like, they really are focusing on their young guys. Um, that's pretty cool. So yeah, there's been like a little bit of shift where it's like, instead of everything revolving around Roman, now they have like, you know, quite a few different, guys um you know it's like we have a really well-rounded group of like young guys and that's pretty cool um so it's like a lot of you know it's like in the end the team you know 
a lot of our leaders ended up struggling this year. It's like Benoit missed like the first half of the year because of a knee injury. Uh, Greg struggled after like the classics for like a few reasons. Oliver Nossen didn't have like his greatest year. Um, Bob ended up having like um, an iliac artery issue. So he missed like almost a whole year. So it's like <clears throat> we, and then even like Mark Sereau, the sprinter they signed ended up like uh, having some health issues and stuff. So, Pretty much all the leaders didn't have great years, but all the guys who are like younger coming up really like stepped up and filled in like those spots, which was really cool because it's like our team almost without the leaders normal points, like they was eighth in the world. We were eighth in the world ranking. And that was like all based off of like a lot of these young guys, like really punching above their weight. So that was kind of cool just to see like really everyone got their chance. Um, And that was pretty sweet because it's like, hopefully if like our leaders get back to their normal level, like this next year, like, and get the points that they normally score, um, it's going to be pretty, pretty good year for the team. So, yeah. And it, one of the biggest pleasant surprises uh, seemed to be uh, Ben O'Connor coming over. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, He's certainly shown some good results as a youngster. I mean, he's been around like the top 20, but I mean, finishing fourth at the tour, um, I think was, is fair to say, like certainly a, a, a higher result than uh, many expected. Um, has that like, has that been like a, a launch pad for him? Like, is, is, is he looking at going back to contend for GC in the future? What do we What's the yeah, absolutely. You know, I think the thing is like, so he was always like a pretty big talent. And then like at the Giro last year, or I mean in 2020, uh, he really like uh, stepped up and he, you know, won a stage and almost won another one. And like, he was really impressive. And then, yeah, pretty much from the start of 2021, he like was really strong and consistent. And then he just got better and better. And he was third overall in Romandy or something like that. And then... Um, yeah ended up uh obviously getting fourth in the tour and winning a stage and so so that was pretty sweet to see um just like because you know he really got his chance on this team which was pretty awesome because i think on a lot of other teams uh he wouldn't have had the same opportunities um and that was that was cool to see because he really took advantage and uh delivered so so yeah it's definitely um you know he'll be a big part of that on the team this year and uh that'd be pretty cool to see. I hope, uh, he can even maybe improve a little bit. So that'd be, that'd be amazing. Uh, and for, what about for you? Do you have a sense for your race schedule early, even early in the season, what that might look like? Yeah. So I start in France, like around here, which should be nice. I do Tour de Provence and then Haute Var, Alp Maritime. Um, I do La Guelia, Paris Nice, Catalonia, um, I do all the Ardennes, so Brabant's Appeal, Amstel, Flesh Wallon, Liège, uh, and then I do Romandy, and then, yeah, we'll see from there. Hopefully Swiss again, and then, yeah, potentially Tour, so that would be pretty cool. Got to imagine the Tour is on the on the to-do list for you. Very is much that, on the to-do list. Is, if you had one thing that would be the your grandest thing for the year, would it, just, would it be to go to the Tour? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. For me, that's like my really big goal this year. Um, and I definitely have like a good shot this year. So uh, it would be really cool if uh, we can see that through. <laughs> wow. Is it? Uh, it seems like a bit of a black box as an, from the outside for, for how a lot of teams select their tour team. If you're inside the fold, is there like, hey, you know, I've got these goals for myself. If I hit these, I'll make the tour team. Or is it always like a massaging of the right team at the right time? I mean, it's definitely, you know, depends on the course, depends on what they're, what like objectives they're going there for, you know? So like, whether they're going for GC or they're going for sprints, whether they're just going for stages in general, mm-hmm. um, like by breakaways. Um, so that's kind of like how they end up deciding, um, you know, where to go like what direction to go um and then things like you know on our team they need like a certain amount of french riders to go um because like the sponsors are french and that's Mm -hmm. really important for them um you know you can't go with a french team with like one french guy you know uh so so yeah that's like another part that goes into the selection and then um yeah i mean other than that it's like they have some guys in mind and if you deliver in terms of like results and you know being a good helper over the course of the year, that's kind of like uh, how you can punch your ticket. 
Yeah. Uh, we'll definitely, I'll, I'll definitely be, be touting the, the Larry to the tour hashtag all, uh, sweet, all, sweet, all yeah. summer for you. Um, outside of that, like, when you look at the season as a whole, not just yourself, not just AG2R, like are any big trends, I'll say hot takes, but not looking for necessarily anything controversial, but things you're looking forward to seeing play out on the, on the pro tour this year. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to think about that one. Sorry. I don't have anything on the top of my, all good. What about, um, it seems like a big momentum shift the last two years between like Ineos and like Yumbo Visma. And then now UAE is really, I mean, taking on some big talent to support Pog. Like how does that actually play out in the Peloton when you see these like different teams really fighting for control of races in like the grand tour scene? Uh, what's that felt like on the ground um, I think we definitely saw like Jumbo kind of surpassing Ineos in terms of like being the, you know, I guess number one team, you know, it's like uh, they def like maybe Ineos has the biggest budget, but like, I think, uh, you know, maybe Jumbo kind of lit like a fire under Ineos's asses a bit because like, um, you know, you saw like, I think in terms of like having, performance dialed and getting the most out of the guys they have like jumbo is like far and away the best whereas yeah. like you know ineos was maybe the best of that before but really they just signed the best guys and then just like you know it's kind of like throwing a bunch of eggs at the wall and seeing which ones don't break and like mm -hmm. uh so <clears throat> you know i think they realize now like oh wow like you look at yeah like a team like jumbo and it's like they're just really good at like developing their talent um even if they didn't like now I'm sure their budget is like really big and growing a ton, but like, you know, over the years, like they didn't have that big a budget and it's like slowly increased with their success. And it's like, they really just invested in the right things and like mm -hmm. uh, done the right things with performance. And I think that's been pretty cool to see. And then like, yeah, UAE obviously has like, you know, been investing heavily and, you know, trying to like make uh, some, big steps in that way and i think they're like advanced but it's still behind those other two teams um in terms of like performance but then also they have such a big budget that they can just sign anyone and uh, i think that's you know they're that's kind of their strategy is like sign sure big talents did you happen to see they did a drone fly through of the yumbo visma facility did i didn't see that i'm gonna send it to you you got to look at it it is super impressive and i'm really interested to know if you think other teams have the same outfit, I mean, it was like a massive warehouse, many tour buses for the teams, all the bike stations. Uh, it was pretty impressive. I'll, I'll send it over to you. Um, all right. A few more uh, quick hitters uh, and then I'll, I'll let you run. But I was curious to know who's the most famous person you've met through cycling. Um. I mean, I guess famous is maybe like Patrick Dempsey. I, I met him at like uh, uh, George's Grand Fondo one year. Um, I mean, well, Lance Armstrong, I guess. Um, also probably the most famous, I would say. Where was uh, that? Um, oh, I met him a couple of times. Uh, like once at George's Grand Fondo and then yep. once uh, in Hawaii. I was there on vacation and then he was there also. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so I met him there. Like some F1 drivers and stuff in the past, but... They're in Nice, like for the Monaco. Oh, yeah, based in Monaco and stuff. So nice. Yeah. George's, his Grand Fondo, that's always down in, it's down in Greenville, down south. Yeah, Carolina. exactly. Now he has them like all over the US. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the, I've only been to the one in Greenville. So awesome. And if you could go for a ride with one person, I guess it could be dead or alive, who would it be? Wait, do I have to be a cyclist or like, is it, uh, I guess you could throw anyone on a, on a bike. Couldn't you? Uh, I guess. Yeah. Hmm. Ah, oh, damn. That's a hard one. Uh, well, maybe my grandfather. Cause like he died when I was like really young and I didn't really get, get, uh, get to know him. So it would have been pretty cool. Uh, I think he had some cool stories and stuff. So, uh, yeah, maybe to go on a ride with him would have been cool. Yeah. That'd be very cool. Um, and I also know, that you're a big basketball fan 
So if you when I was a kid, I was like a huge basketball fan. I can't say I followed too closely uh, recently, but okay. So if you were gonna go one on one with somebody, who who might that be? Uh, I don't know. Well, I guess if we're gonna like keep on the cycling thing, you know, it's pretty cool to see that like uh, Reggie Miller is really into cycling. Um, yeah. So maybe it'd be something like that because uh, yeah, he's like really really into it. I think that's pretty sweet. So, you guys can do a duathlon. Was... You do you yeah, climb exactly. out and then shoot free throws. Yeah, perfect. That'd be sweet. Um, well, Larry, that's all I got. Any any other thoughts or anything else you wanna you wanna share out there today? No, I think uh, yeah, that covered pretty much everything. So, thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks so much, Larry. Much appreciated. 